So first things first, of course, I want to thank you and uh, Virginie as well and the Center for Research in International History and History of the Atlantic at the University of Nantes, as you said, for inviting me to participate in this conference. And most importantly, I also want to thank you for you know, launching this extremely interesting project uh, for the, the JASCOM uh, project. Um, I also want to thank you uh, for inviting me to you know, give the opening um, keynote. I must confess that um, I'm always surprised, you know, whenever I'm invited to give any keynote. So I always feel I'm not the right person to do that. Uh, so many, you know, other people would do much better. And um, in this case, I was doubly surprised because the thread of thought I've been developing recently and that I had been, you know, in conversation about with uh, Francoise is actually taking me to a place that is not quite the same as the one you want to be in with this, uh, you know, conference and YESCOM uh, program. So, uh, but then, you know, you confirmed that it was what you wanted. And so off focus can be interesting as well. Uh, so I thought it was wonderful that, you know, you wanted to, um, in a way, look elsewhere uh, as you open this cycle, uh, not in the usual meaning of the phrase as in, you know, regarder ailleurs or détourner le regard uh, in, uh, in French, as to, you know, look away for, for, from uh, something, but as in hosting, in fact, an alternative perspective right away, that is, not necessarily, you know, diving right into the topic of the conference and circuitous routes can often be, you know, interesting and fruitful. So it's just an invitation to um, uh, take in, you know, a few other perspectives as well. And I'm definitely not uh, a historian. I'm definitely not a South Asianist either. Uh, so I want to insist on that, but I do come from diaspora and Caribbean studies. So I do consider myself as a literary scholar in Caribbean and Indo-Caribbean studies and literatures. And in many different ways, I came to India through the Caribbean. Uh, so I've been, you know, exploring recently um, also fields that were not mine originally, uh, Dalit studies, for instance, uh, and entering fields one is not a specialist of. I mean, it implies, of course, a certain number of risks but it's quite exhilarating and uh, it can take you quite far, in fact, from your comfort zones. Uh, but it, it also gives you, you know, the feeling that you are hosted. And of course, you're not hosted if you are at home. So um, when used in India, the phrase Kalapani uh, is most often associated with uh, the cellular jail, as you know in Port Blair, where freedom fighters and other dissidents were sent by the British um, colonial authorities in the early 20th century. When used in the diaspora, uh, it refers to the large scale migration you have just mentioned and, and you're going to focus on. So out, out of India in the, the 1830s, where more than a million of Indians, both willingly and unwillingly, left the subcontinent and crossed the black waters, the forbidden sea between India and the Americas or the Indian Ocean. So to work in the sugar plantations, of course, as indentured laborers, bound coolies, not only in the British Empire, but also French, Danish, Dutch um, colonies. So uh, of course there was need for um, labor on the plantations after African enslavement was legally abolished. Uh, as you know, and um, even if my focus is mostly Indo-Caribbean, of course, I keep in mind Fiji and Mauritius, as well as all the, the British, French and Dutch Caribbean and South and East um, Africa, obviously, where these indentured laborers also went to work on the, the railways and sugar plantations. But you know all that, so uh, yeah, you, don't, you certainly don't, don't need me to remind you of anything or give you any details. Um, so the um, uh, maybe something I, I want to uh, you know insist on because you are mostly historians. I mean this this history of the crossing of the Indian and Atlantic Oceans towards African and American shores 
uh, between 1834 and 1917, 1920, when the, the system of indentorship was declared illegal. Um, it, it has now rather well uh, been, you know, researched. And even if one can always point out that, of course, not enough has been done with and about the history of the ensuing creolization and of the literature and the arts that have emerged out of that indentorship, the way fiction and non-fiction, um, scholarly and non-scholarly writers have been feeding on each other's work in the past 30, 40 years is I think quite remarkable. Uh, so it seems to me that the times of oblivion and neglect uh, are over uh, in a way and in the early 21st century it also seems that a new momentum has been gained under the impulsion of a new generation of scholars and writers. And um, Ashutosh is, uh, is there, so you know, I'm going to, to refer to, uh, to your book, uh, Ashutosh, so quite a bit. Uh, if it had been in writing, I would have said, you know, Ashutosh Kumar and then referred to Kumar, but you're here, so you will be Ashutosh. Um, so in his uh, recent Coolies of the Empire, Indentured Indians in the Sugar, uh, in the sugar Colonies, 1830-1920, Ashutosh gives a detailed overview of the different stages of oblivion, neglect, and renewed interest uh, in indentorship uh, studies and um, uh, indenture and creolization as well. So having been set up in the wake of the abolition of Atlantic slavery, the, inde the Indian indenture system immediately became the object of much contemporary criticism from uh, politicians and humanitarians who had fought against the Atlantic slave trade in all the British abolitionist uh, campaigns. So this, Ashutosh says, I mean, lasted until the 1870s when the, uh, the indenture system had become institutionalized uh, in a way by the colonial officials, in fact, on the Indian side. So um, of course, we can resort to the older colonial archives, reports, pamphlets, gazettes, letters exchanged between the protectors of immigrants and protectors of immigrants in Port of Spain, for instance, in uh, Georgetown and also uh, in uh, Calcutta. Uh, all kinds of official statements, early narratives, etc. Ashutosh also mentions pioneering historians for their research on the early indentured um, emigration from India and reminds us of a few foundational moments in uh, indentorship historiography. So very extremely briefly, 1970s, 1980s, with uh, Hugh Tinker's work and Bridge Lal, uh, obviously. Um, and so, um, just again, a couple of, of words. Um, so if, I mean, Tinker definitely insisted on the direct continuity between uh, the Atlantic slavery and the indenture system. Um, uh, so thus, I mean, situating himself in the wake of, uh, of 19th century pro-abolitionists. Lal, on, his, on, on the other hand, positioned himself as a direct descendant of Fiji Gemetias. And interestingly, he debunked uh, the myth according to which only untouchable, former untouchable, not yet Dalits, uh, or low caste individuals or communities had indentured themselves. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, whenever I gave talks or seminars or met, you know, with people in India, um, even until, you know, a few years ago, it would always uh, come again. I mean, it would always be, the official discourse would always be that it was only low caste people who migrated. Um, so, of course, once, uh, once a foray had been made in the late uh, 70s and uh, 18, 80s, the 80s, other scholars uh, followed suit. So we all have in mind uh, the names of uh, Basudeu Mangru, Brinsley Samaru, Kumar Mahabir, Clemsi Charan, DJ Mishra, John Kelly, etc. Crispin Bates, Marina Carter, uh, and I'm forgetting uh, others, um, obviously. So gradually, scholars working on indentured labor and the legacy of indentorship have carved a space for themselves 
alongside or sometimes against uh, South Asian studies, diaspora studies, Indian Ocean studies. And so this, the, you know, the emerging uh, of this field is also, I'm sure, quite interesting to, um, uh, to look at. So um, it seems like that, um, like the Black Atlantic in its own time, it seems that Kalapani studies have developed um, as a major field across disciplines and continents, one whose focus is the cultures that have been affected by the early Kalapani crossing. So, of course, it is anchored deep in history and social sciences, but I also, I'm a literary scholar after all, I also want to insist um, that it is through literature, fiction, nonfiction, uh, nonfiction writing and analysis that the field has gained in depth and won its spurs um, in a way several decades ago. So again, 1960s, 1970s, pioneer writers, and I certainly don't want to quote only V.S. Naipaul. Uh, so V.S. Naipaul, among you know others, he's not the only one. So I, you know, I would quote Mahadai Das, Peter Kempadu, uh, Ismit Khan, Harold Soniladu, Rajkumar Singh, to name just a few within the, the Indo-Caribbean context. Of course, they have paved the way uh, forward. Closer to us, Cyril Dabidin, David Abidin, Ramaba Espine, Arnold Itwaru, Shani Mutu, uh, again, among others, have redefined the contours of one's attachment to a single home, to a home that would be single, to a single nation, um, to a self that would be single, but maybe not. So all these writers have been searching for ways to create new spaces that would include multi-layered conceptions of home, self, and national belonging. Um, so comparing the work done at the end of the 20th and in the early 21st century with the, the work done in the earlier period, um, the differences and the evolutions are quite striking, I must say. But, you know, again, as historians, um, um, you will, you know, say whether you have the same um, impression or not. Um, Probably the discussion will be about um, that as well. So it seems that the debate has been much less dominated by indentorship as it was considered as a second slavery, obviously. Uh, and the Indians who indentured themselves seem not to be considered as uh, victims anymore, not victims only. So scholars, again, such as Brinda Mehta, Marian Pirbai, Gabriel Hossein, Lisa Uttar, Patricia Mohammed, uh, to name just a few, have adopted a very powerful reinterpretation of history and in a decolonial way, put an increased emphasis on women's agency and empowerment. So more emphasis has also been put on laborers who, as Francoise was saying at the opening of the, uh, of the conference, laborers who chose to re-indenture themselves to other colonies, uh, I know PhDs are, are um, you know, being uh, worked on and submitted at the moment on, on that topic, uh, or simply refused, maybe they, they simply refused to be forcefully shipped back uh, to India. And when I looked into the archives and looked into the letters that were exchanged between protectors of immigrant and immigrants, um, there were, you know, several of those uh, letters indicating um, that. So even if it meant, uh, even if it, it took them to the extent of committing suicide. And um, more emphasis still has been placed on the reshuffling of social parameters, looking into the multiple ways migration gave the Gimetias opportunities to escape family pressures, uh, rigid socioeconomic structures, caste oppression, gender discrimination, sexual exploitation, etc. So finally, it seems that there has been a noticeable shift towards including the indenture migrations within diaspora studies, while at the same time preserving um, a kind of uh, specific status, in fact, for Kalapani uh, studies. Yet. I'm coming to my yet. So um, 
even if the, the historiography is now abundant and detailed, uh, but maybe as historians, we, you will not agree with, the, with this, um, even if the academic criticism that has been published has made you know, the creations in literature, film, and the arts um, shine brighter in a way, um, it's always the diasporic point of view of the countries the indentured laborers went to that has prevailed. Um, Ashutosh was already remarking in his, uh, in his book that there was, quote, a curious lacuna regarding indenture as far as 19th century mainstream Indian political and political economic discourse was concerned, unquote. So such an important um, historical moment hardly featured anywhere in historical discourse in 19th century India. In 20th century India, I mean, it took decades to put indenture migrations and indentureship on the global um, scholarly map, but one has to admit that um, indentureship has not been a focus of interest in India itself. So um, it's not well known from the, uh, by the general public. It's not part of the school or university curriculum. Um, it's not part of the many diaspora festivals in India. I mean, speaking of the old uh, diaspora and indenture uh, diaspora, few academics based in India or in, South Indi or in South Asia research it or write about it from the perspective of India. Only a few have studied the return migrations. Hardly any writers, filmmakers, or artists have explored the complexities of the Kalapadi. So there is a curious imbalance in the fact that while the diaspora literature written by those whose forefathers had left India to work in various colonies as indentured laborers during the British rule has been the topic of major academic and political discourse, very scant attention has been given in India to those members of the early diaspora and to their descendants. So Indian students and, and general readers, sometimes academics as well, are often almost unaware of this history that is not so distant from us. Um, if you look into the, uh, the diaspora, I mean, they, there are quite a few museums, memorial sites and other sites of conscience uh, that are set up in the diaspora, even if not all of them are national heritage sites. Um, one can think of the, the historical and cultural heritage of uh, Apavasi Ghat in Mauritius, uh, the Indian arrival uh, monument on Plantation Highbury in Guyana, the Nelson Island heritage site in Trinidad, the Lazare quarantine center uh, of Grand Chaloupe on uh, Reunion Island, the commemorative monument along the Saramaka River in Suriname, among others. So those will be the most uh, important ones. Comparatively, India, and of course you will set me right if I have missed you know, some of those um, sites, but I think the, the, um, the most important one and, and almost the only ones, the only one is the, uh, the museum that was set up in 2009 by the Kolkata Port Trust, Maritime Archives and Heritage Center um, in, uh, so in, in Calcutta. The trust also set up uh, the memorial to the indentured laborers in 2011 and the Suriname Memorial in 2015. But I think those are um, the only ones in, uh, in India. Hardly any diaspora festivals refer to the 19th century migrations apart from the first uh, Pavasi Film Festival in Delhi in 2010, for which Cooley Pink and Green, uh, which is a documentary, a kind of creative documentary film by Trinidadian uh, Patricia Mohammed, was selected for screening uh, and was shown in, um, at that festival in January 2010. So in fact, the new diaspora has much more allure, both in popular imagination and in state policies, as you know. And uh, Amba Pandey has uh, you know, worked on this and, and uh, sh uh, uh, shown it you know, very significantly and very clearly. So working on diaspora as soft power. 
uh, and uh, in the last three decades, I mean, successive governments at the, at the center have attached greater significance, of course, to the NRIs, OCI, uh, et cetera, for economic and political uh, reasons. The present Modi government, uh, I mean, departments were created uh, for the purpose, diaspora festivals, film, uh, festivals initiated, um, etc. But not so much. Um, about the old uh, diaspora. The Indian chapter of the old diaspora continues not to be heard enough. So in fact, many questions can be raised about this lacuna. Um, how come that this history is better known out of India than in India itself? Doesn't one need at some stage to invert the mirror and retrieve the forgotten chapters of Indian history? Americans were poor, often low caste, not always, often illiterate, even though not necessarily from the low castes. They were going to uh, another colony as indentured laborers to work in backbreaking jobs on sugar plantations. Um, they were not going to the mother country, they were just going to another colony. Uh, so, what can be the advantages of? shining a torch onto a history that has been kept invisible for all those reasons and more. Was it neatly made invisible by design or are we still dealing with the, um, the messy business of memory, history and uh, historiography? What is the point? What would be the point um, in emphasizing episodes that most people in, the, in India are very happy to forget about? So what can be gained, in fact, from such a revisiting in 21st uh, century India? And how can those archives of the past bear an impact on um, our reading of the present and influence our shaping of the future? That, it seems to me, you know, a fairly interesting question. Um, at the end of the, of the first decade of the 21st century, however, it seems that um, three people have provided for um, uh, a game changer. So one internationally acclaimed writer of Indian origin, an American journalist of Indo-Guyanese descent, and an Indian academic provided that game changer uh, within 10 years. So it's very quick and it's fairly significant. Uh, so between 2008 and 2015, Amitav Ghosh's uh, Ibis trilogy was published. Gayutra Bahadur's Coolie Woman, The Odyssey of Indenture was published in 2013. And Ashutosh's book, uh, Coolies of the Empire, was published in 2017. So novel writing, nonfiction and archival work, and academic research have operated in a striking conjunction to give Kalapani crossings, another fresh momentum. And it's interesting that they have received a lot of interest in, uh, in India. So all three authors, for different reasons, have you know, received um, high acclaim. And it seems that the perspective is, uh, um, is changing uh, in, um, in quite a few ways. So um, uh, I mean, you 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 know, uh, gosh, and I mean, you know the three books that I've uh, that I've um, referred to. Uh, what makes Ashutosh's book quite unique, in fact, is the the showcasing of indentorship as a holistic process. And I think it's the the first time, in fact, that one has been paying serious attention, quote unquote. Uh, to the, the quotidian sociocultural life in the villages in the Gangetic Plains. So uh, it's interesting that this indenture system cannot be understood um, unless you go back to the life in, in the villages. And I would add that maybe it cannot be understood or um, yes, it cannot be understood if we uh, don't look at our present as well in the 21st uh, century. Interestingly as well, um, the whole book, I mean, Coolies of the Empire, uh, also hinges on the three figures that uh, Ashutosh calls extraordinary gameteers. So Baba Hamchandra, 
can be traced upon his return to India in 1915 after um, he spent 10 years in, uh, in Fiji. Uh, Totaram Sanadia emigrated to Fiji uh, at the end of the 19th and then wrote his autobiography and he went back to India in uh, 1914. Uh, and Munshi Raman Khan was a Muslim novelist uh, and uh, a poet as well, writing in Urdu. Uh, who went to Suriname and who chose to stay in Suriname. So these uh, three figures are given, um, you know, quite an interesting uh, focus, in fact, in the, um, um, in the book. And again, I would like to emphasize the fact that uh, Sanadia's autobiography was translated by um, John Kelly and Utra Kumar Singh in 1991. But in fact, there was, a, I think there was another um, uh, translation, but there was also Khan's uh, autobiography that was published in India in 2005, in 2005, in a translation um, also. So again, this translation you know, business, I mean, helps us to see what is actually uh, getting uh, traction. Um, um, Francoise, let me know how much time do I have about your mic? Two to three minutes. You can, you know, how much time do you need? Uh, five, uh, five, five minutes, minutes or so? Three, five minutes would be good if you have, if you want. Okay. Yeah, five, two, yeah. three, up, up to five. Yeah. Yeah, about okay. five minutes, yeah. So in fact, this is, this is why, uh, I mean, those three figures have also featured, you know, prominently in, um, in the, the Kalapani uh, crossing series. So the first one happened at, uh, at the IAS in, uh, in Shimla, the Institute um, of Advanced Study, and the second one in, at the University of Pondicherry. Uh, so just before the, the crisis closed the, uh, the borders and, uh, and everything. And so uh, I just want to give uh, a few names. And of course, this is going to get into the, uh, I mean, two volumes are going to be published with, so that there were a lot of conversations, a lot of exchanges, uh, papers were presented. Uh, and of course the papers were revised and then transformed into chapters. And Routledge has um, agreed to the, you know, has uh, confirmed that they were interested in bringing out and publishing two companion volumes, so you know, I will certainly let you know. Um, and so some of the people who have been on board, um, in fact, are uh, people like Mala Pandurang, uh, Vijay Mishra, Supana Sengupta, Joshil uh, Abraham, Nandini Dar, Ritu Tiagi, uh, Vijay Rao, Ridi Matewari, uh, Kusuma Garbal, Himadri Lahiri, Ravin Mirda, Arnab Sinha, Udita Banaji, Kanchan Dar, uh, and Amba Pande, uh, and also uh, in Pondicherry, Oritra Munshi, uh, Gargi Duta, and Jenny uh, Balasobramanian. So um, they have all, um, you know, risen to the challenge because it was extremely challenging for diaspora scholars to suddenly be invited to invert their perspective. And it was, you know, extremely challenging in uh, in many ways, but so uh, so interesting. So I'm hoping it's going to develop into um, um, series. And of course, at the same time as you know, just as the the Pondicherry event uh, was um, uh, finishing, the COVID-19 uh, crisis started. And uh, in fact, it was um, extremely, you know, ironical, tragic, dramatic that the, the phrase, the migrant crisis, you know, which used to refer to the crisis as it was triggered in the Mediterranean uh, in the wake of the Arab Spring in 2011, now had started to refer to the migrant crisis as it had been triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown that was ordered on March 24th um, uh, in India. So again, I mean, the, the happening at, you know, at the same time of those uh, events was extremely um, uh, striking. Those, you know, refugee, I mean, we all saw the, the images and the, uh, the headlines, uh, et cetera. So all those refuge seekers 
they were not refugee in the administrative political meaning of the term, but those refuge seekers who were thrown on the roads by the million somehow had to remind us of former refuge seekers, former asylum seekers crossing borders during partition. Of course, it's different. Of course, the context is very different. But we have to make the comparison. It is there, in fact, at the back of our minds. Uh, so crossing borders, looking for a place to establish themselves without being victimized, without being discriminated against or shamed. Uh, and of course, past and present traumas refract each other. So one trauma always brings back, uh, you know, an earlier one. So all the images of the migrants, you know, flashing on our TV screens and in the headlines uh, of the papers are those laborers and daily wages um, who were forced to leave the metropolitan cities mm, that they were uh, living in and who you know, walked for days and weeks to reach their villages, uh, sometimes dying on the, on the way. So 19th century migrations, I mean, that happened again in a different context, but in the context of great poverty, colonial and domestic oppression, um, the, um, the recruitment and the indentorship I mean, was prompted by the colonial uh, powers for you know, well-known geopolitical and economic reasons. Um, though you know, the indentured I mean, uh, eventually negotiated it to their advantage uh, later on. In the 21st century, the Indian uh, state cannot blame it on uh, the outside uh, colonizing powers. Um, and, you know, in, in many, I mean, if we, if we think about the possibility of a comparison, of course, in both cases, immigrants left because they couldn't stay. Uh, they left not to starve. Uh, in the latter COVID migration, they also came back not to starve. Sometimes they still starved. Um, contrary to migrations that took them across borders, to a newly formed country in the case of the partition or uh, across the seas, uh, the Indian state in a way had produced its own refugees, if, except that those refugees were not able to seek refuge nor to seek asylum. Um, and another point of comparison, but I want to cut this uh, short and get to my conclusion, very short conclusion. Another point of comparison would probably be the ostracization and the shaming uh, that happened upon the return, whether they came back from uh, uh, the Caribbean or Fiji or Mauritius and tried to get back into, uh, into a um, caste society, uh, India, or whether they came back from the metropolitan cities and went back to their villages, they were uh, ostracized and shamed in, in, uh, in many ways. So, Again, I mean, it's that, you know, that figure of the refugee and the migrant uh, that is still haunting us as if um, there were still pawns um, in what Ashin Bembe calls necropolitics. So being left to wonder whether they're going to be killed or whether they're going to be allowed to live. So in conclusion, um, such a comparison is one of the reasons why uh, I think it would be important today to open the pages of that history again, not only from the point of view of the diaspora, not only for the sake of remembering and knowing more, but also from the perspective of India in the 21st uh, century. So it is present day Indian society that is to be approached and scanned through the displaced lens of the Kalapani crossings. And it is such discursive dialogues as the one that happened in that series that invite us, in fact, to rethink indentorship through the prism of India today and vice versa, reversing the gaze. More generally speaking, scrutinizing those migrations of the past and their descendants may be a detour to gain a better view of India when it seems to be fumbling for a redefinition uh, of itself. So, this could be um, the beginning of fresh research, one that would place a heightened focus on present day caste discrimination and on the violence perpetrated against women in, uh, in India, how discrimination and violence were addressed 
uh, and re responded to by indentured laborers of the old uh, indentured diaspora and their descendants is crucial to investigate now more than ever, but also for the sake of India. And it also says something of India today. And you know, going back to my introduction, uh, sometimes looking elsewhere may indeed be one of the best routes to, uh, to take not to look away. So thank you very much.